In four years, the asteroid Apophis will make a very close approach to our planet, passing closer than any asteroid of any significant size has passed to our planet in recorded history. This is a huge astronomical event by anybody's standards, and even though NASA insists that there is no chance no chance at all that Apophis will actually make contact with the Earth, we actually aren't really going to know that for another two years at least. As of right now, Apophis is still lost in the sun's glare, and our trajectory combined with Apophis's trajectory is going to keep that asteroid lost in the glare until 2027, meaning that if our calculations end up being just a little bit off. If something has happened to Apophis while we weren't watching it that's going to put it on a collision course, we are going to have a mere two years to do something about it. And as of right now, we are doing virtually nothing to avert a potential planet-killing asteroid from striking our planet should something like that rear its ugly head in the near future. Yes, we tested the DART mission on a near by asteroid which proved to be extremely successful. And even though the DART probe only weighed a few hundred kilograms, the speed of impact was so swift that when it actually occurred, it produced an explosion on the level of about three tons worth of TNT, which was certainly enough to deflect an asteroid that was as small as the target in mind, which was an asteroid orbiting a larger one reason we did that, by the way, is we could very easily tell how much we deflected the trajectory of this asteroid by comparing its orbit post-impact as opposed to its pre-orbit trajectory. But Apophis is approximately double the size of Dimorphos, which is the target of the DART mission, by the way, and also we aren't manufacturing any new DART probes at the moment, and if we wait until the last minute, it could be difficult to throw a mission like that together in a mere two years and carry it out with a 100% chance of success. And we can't afford anything less than a 100% chance of success given the consequences of an Apophis impact. Apophis, as I've mentioned a number of times before, would deliver an explosion in excess of two gigatons worth of TNT. This is more than the nuclear arsenals of most nuclear powers on the planet, and in addition to that, it would throw up enough dust, debris, and soot to create a nuclear winter and a worldwide famine of epic proportions. So why is nobody doing anything about this? Why are we not at least playing it safe and building something that could deflect an incoming asteroid should something like that show up unexpectedly in the near future? Well, interestingly enough, a longtime veteran NASA contractor is indeed building something that could do the job. Even though it isn't specifically designed to deflect asteroids, it's definitely capable of doing it. It's an interceptor with interplanetary capability, and if they can get the job done quickly, they might have it ready just in time for Apophis, should Apophis turn out to be a lot more deadly than NASA is telling us. So you want to build an asteroid interceptor, but what do you really need to create something like that? I mean, it sounds very much like a missile, doesn't it? Why not just hit an incoming asteroid with a nuclear missile and be done with it? Well, asteroids that are on a collision course, especially at very high speed, as most are, are not going to be deflectable if you try to intercept them in low Earth orbit or even in geosynchronous orbit. 
By the time an asteroid gets that close, it's going to hit. And even though you might be able to blow it into fragments with a nuclear blast, all of those fragments are going to continue plummeting towards our planet at roughly the same speed and trajectory and will just impact in numerous locations instead of just one. And so this is why the DART mission had to be carried out the way it was, intercepting an asteroid at very considerable distance from the Earth Earth, and these asteroids, of course, were not in any sort of danger of hitting the Earth in the foreseeable future anyway, but still, you need something with interplanetary capability, something that will strike the incoming asteroid while it's still millions of kilometers, and preferably hundreds of millions of kilometers, away from Earth. And if it is that far away, then the amount that you have to deflect it by, the trajectory shift that's necessary, is very very minimal. You barely need to deflect the incoming projectile at all to miss the Earth if you carry out the interception months or years ahead of time. And so this is what the so-called Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART for short, carried out in 2022. At a speed of just over 6 kilometers per second, a probe massing approximately 600 or so kilograms slammed into the target asteroid and deflected it significantly. As a matter of fact, the trajectory shift was far more significant than NASA was anticipating. An unqualified success. And so this demonstrated that if we want to deflect an asteroid that's of a reasonable size, in other words, perhaps the size of Apophis or even a little bit bigger, don't need a nuclear explosion, we don't need an explosive device at all. All we need is a chunk of dead weight, an unmanned spacecraft, nothing, anything more spectacular than that, something that weighs a few hundred kilograms or preferably a bit more if the asteroid is a bit heavier, and just slam the thing into the asteroid at a high rate of speed. And this is precisely what the ULA company is building. It's something called the Centaur 5 Upper Stage for the Vulcan Centaur rocket. Now, this may not look like a sophisticated interceptor, but it actually is. And ULA has been designing this for a considerable amount of time, although it's gone through a number of iterations and evolution over the years. ULA originally called this the ACES Upper upper stage, and the intention was to use this thing for a variety of different purposes that conventional rocket stages just can't do. And one of the reasons for this is your average second stage for a rocket goes inactive after maybe 30 minutes to an hour, at most a couple of hours before an upper stage runs out of fuel, before its electronics stop working, before it essentially becomes nothing more than a piece of dead weight flying through space. But the Centaur 5 and the Aces before it was designed to stay operational for days, perhaps even months months or even years. Its shielded guidance systems and electronics remain operational for a very long period of time and it can relight its engines over and over again. This makes it incredibly useful for, say, a lunar tug designed to push heavy weights from low Earth orbit to the moon and back, and periodically you refuel the Centaur 5 and just use it all over again. So it's essentially a reusable rocket that never re-enters the atmosphere, it just operates from low Earth orbit to other destinations throughout the solar system. But recently, ULA CEO Tori Bruno has suggested a another possible use for the Centaur 5. It can also be a loitering interceptor. What does that mean? It means the Centaur 5 remains in low Earth orbit with fuel on board, active avionics, active engines that can be relit at will, waiting for a potential incoming threat. A 
military threat in most cases. This would be designed, for example, to intercept a satellite that was attempting to knock down one of our space stations or knock down an important military satellite. What essentially amounts to an orbital interceptor on demand. But what it could also be used for is to knock an incoming asteroid off target if needed without having to prepare a rocket ahead of time, without having to prepare a mission, without having to do anything. Instead, a Centaur 5, after having already carried out a couple of other missions, could simply be loaded with a dummy payload, a dead weight, and left loitering either in low Earth orbit or preferably in lunar orbit where the gravity isn't as significant, and just have it wait for a potential incoming threat. And then when one is detected, the Centaur 5's engines are fired up and it heads out to intercept the target. We could have two or three of these deployed, again, without warheads on board, without them being military weapons, at least not officially, prepared to knock down military threats, but also prepared to intercept asteroids should it become necessary. And the Centaur 5 would be even more effective than the Dart ever was. The Centaur 5 on its own, empty, weighs more than twice as much as the DART did, and it's already capable of interplanetary missions without any significant modifications. As a matter of fact, ULA disposes of Centaur 5s in graveyard orbits that orbit the Sun not orbiting the Earth, so already Centaur 5s are being deployed to interplanetary destinations. So this would be perhaps the simplest, most basic, but most effective type of asteroid interceptor I can think of, and it can be developed without any additional money being invested, given the fact that ULA is already investing in making the Centaur 5 an interceptor. According to Defense News, quote, the company has an incremental plan to get to this lightning-fast, long-range, lethal if necessary Centaur 5 through regular upgrades to the existing system. The modifications would happen annually or perhaps on a more frequent cadence and then validated on flights of the Vulcan rocket. And the U.S. Space Force definitely sees the value in this type of interceptor. The head of U.S. Space Command, General Stephen White, Whiting had this to say, quote, We need some kind of capability to be maneuverable in the space domain and not be confined to only operating with the fuel, the propellant we were launched with. We want to operate until the mission is finished, not until the fuel we were launched with runs out. And that is exactly what Centaur 5 is designed to do, to keep operating, to remain operational, and to have its engines remain operational through multiple refuelings and through many months worth of use, even while it's loitering in space. But the big question is, Will ULA actually have a more advanced version of Centaur 5 ready to go by the time 2029 rolls around? It definitely seems that way, but at the same time, given the crushing competition that SpaceX is providing to this company at the moment, and also the unconfirmed rumors that Jeff Bezos may buy them out, and if he does buy them out, he's most probably going to shut the Vulcan Centaur program down forever. But if ULA is able to bring Centaur 5 to a high level of maturity on schedule, we may very well have an interceptor capable of protecting us not only from military threats, but also from interplanetary threats at precisely the time we're going to need it. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And also, I have a special giveaway to announce for the month of January. This, by the way, is the month that Google really pulls the rug out from under us creators and slashes ad revenue and the time when we need support the most. You may recall the last time that I was in Boca Chica, I gave away a piece of the launch facility and I'll be giving away two more pieces this month. 
one to a random Patreon supporter, and one to a random Super Thanks supporter. In other words, just hit that little button that says Super Thanks, and you will automatically be entered into a drawing. Unfortunately, the only folks who can qualify for this are people that I can affordably deliver a fragment of the launch pad to, which means you have to be in North America, and either Canada or the United States, or in Europe in order to be able to play. It's far too expensive for me to ship these things anywhere else. Sorry about that. But for those of you who do live in those regions, just either become Patreon supporters, or if you're already a Patreon supporter, you're already entered, or hit that super thanks button and you will automatically be entered. And only folks who hit that button this month will actually be in the drawing. So you have a pretty decent chance of winning either way, and you'll also be really supporting this channel channel at a time that I need it. Thanks again for watching, and as always, stay angry about space.